there is usually a little bit of a delay, but in a few seconds we should be live. And we're live. <laughs> um, not sure if we should. Uh... I think we should wait for a couple of minutes uh, to, okay. yeah, let people trickle in. We can start with the presentation. We can start with the introduction. There's already a few folks who join us. And so we can go ahead and tell a little bit about the uh, user group and a little bit about the sponsors, about our guests. Um, so I'm gonna uh, give the word to you, Alex, and could you All introduce right. the Welcome everyone. Uh, so uh, we are uh, PyData Montreal. So uh, we've been uh, running this uh, meetup group for almost two years now. So pre-pandemic, uh, it's been purely a local event and as uh, pretty much every meetup, we we're uh, forced to go, uh, go uh, online. So uh, our kind of parent organization is NumFocus. Uh, this is, uh, they sponsor our meetup subscription, provide kind of guidance and help uh, in organizing uh, the events. And our other sponsor is uh, JetBrains. Uh, actually, we'll uh, mention uh, their contributions a little bit uh, later in a few slides. So uh, first thing to mention is we have uh, a little bit of uh, unexpected schedule change. Uh, because unfortunately, uh, L. O'Brien, uh, she uh, got sick today, and uh, we have to we had to kind of reschedule and move uh, some things around. So today, uh, Josh Tobin is going to be our first and uh, only speaker. Uh, he'll be talking about uh, testing production machine learning systems, and. Uh, We'll be uh, occasionally asking questions kind of uh, throughout the presentation and have a dedicated uh, five to 10 minute uh, Q&A session after that. Uh, so to uh, kind of, uh, I wanna introduce uh, Josh uh, before uh, giving uh, uh, kind of the stage to him. So uh, Josh Tobin is the founder and CEO of a stealth uh, machine learning startup. Previously, Josh uh, worked uh, as a deep learning and robotics uh, researcher at OpenAI, as well as a management consultant at uh, uh, McKinsey. He uh, is also a creator of a full stack deep learning course. Uh, I think the link uh, to that course is listed on the Meetup page. Uh, and this is the first uh, course focused on kind of emerging engineering discipline uh, of production machine learning. And uh, finally, Josh uh, did his PhD in uh, computer science at uh, uh, UC Berkeley, advised by uh, Peter Abel. So uh, kind of one uh, last note uh, from my side, I went through all the videos in this uh, full stack deep learning course, and this course is amazing. I highly recommend it, uh, like at least check it out. Uh, so it's uh, kind of a fairly unique course. It's not focused on any specific machine learning algorithms, but more on the kind of the end-to-end -end life cycle of uh, uh, machine learning systems. So uh, one last thing before I pass it on to Josh is um, that Maria and I uh, kind of run this survey for all the participants of PyData. Uh, and there's just like a couple of questions asking about uh, the interests of uh, our audience so that we can take that into account and adjust kind of these topics and the speakers that we invite for future sessions. So the benefit for you to fill out this uh, survey is that you uh, will get a chance to win one of the two uh, JetBrains ID. Uh, I think that's, a, so that's an annual subscription to any uh, ID that uh, JetBrains uh, uh, works on. And uh, another benefit is you'll be able to help us out to kind of tailor uh, future sessions for uh, your interest. So with that said, I'm going to pass it on to Josh. Great. Thanks so much. Um, and thanks for the kind words about full stack deep learning. Um, I guess it's uh, the course is available online for free. So I would encourage you to check it out if you find this topic interesting. Um, 
Okay, so I'm going to be talking about testing production machine learning systems. Um, so I, I guess like the the first thing that I want to start out with is just why, like why should why is this worth uh, your time to listen to a talk on this, right? And so I think I'll I'll start by uh, you know painting the opposite picture, which I think uh, maybe is a caricature caricature, but I think is close to what a lot of people in the maybe the academic world believe about machine learning, right? And so that's this idea that like okay, you know, you, you've, um, you've picked out your training set and your validation set, you've worked on your models, the, you know, your training score is down below the target, your validation score is below the target and, you know, your test score looks good, right? So, so that means you're done, right? Like in academia, that's true. Like if, if your test loss looks really good, then you can write a nice paper. Um, but the challenge is that when you're building real world machine learning systems, even if you've trained a good enough model to get the test, the loss on your test set to be below the threshold that you need in order to solve the problem in the real world, um, there's a lot that can still go wrong, right? So what are some of those things? Um, one really common thing is that, you know, your test loss, like the, your, your loss on the validation set or the test set is just kind of a single number that represents the performance of your model. Um, but in the real world, it's often very difficult to capture all the performance characteristics that we want of our models using a single number. And so your, your performance could be lacking on um, any of a number of more granular metrics, right? So for example, um, you might have optimized your model to get the best accuracy, but there might be other things that you care about, right? For example, like the latency of the model. And so, you know, your accuracy could be better, but your latency could be worse. Um, when your validation loss or your test loss is below some threshold, that tells you about the average performance across all the data in that data set. But um, in the real world, a lot of times we, we don't just care about the average performance. We care about the performance on many different slices of that data, right? So for example, um, there, you might have slices that are associated with a particular set of users um, that you don't want to bias your model against. And so, um, you know, even if your validation loss is better than it was, or if it's below some threshold, you still could be doing worse than you need to be doing on some critical subsets of your data. So in addition to more granular performance lacking, um, the, the model that you actually deploy in production in many cases um, in machine learning right now is actually could have different performance characteristics than the model that you developed, right? So in many organizations, um, machine learning models are not just, are not shipped into production by the people who are developing them, right? And so a lot of times, for example, you might be translating your model from Python into um, like a Java runtime. And there can be bugs in how you translate you know, for example, your pre-processing code into the production version. Um, even if the model that you're deploying like has the right performance and uh, doesn't have any bugs when you deploy it, some of the data that's going into that model can break over uh, over time, right? And so a really common source of that is um, pipeline changes, right? So in more complex organizations, you, you're developing a model, that model depends on some features. Your team might be developing those features but it might not, right? You might be depending on some other team to develop those features for you. And so if they introduce a bug or if they change a definition of a feature in a way that doesn't even seem like a bug, that can all of a sudden break your model. Another really common cause of, you know, test loss being good, but your production model being bad is, you know, when, when you train a model on, on some training set and you deploy it, you're making an implicit assumption that the data that you see in production is gonna look like the data that you saw at training time. Right. And so that assumption um, doesn't always hold. So for example, you know, if you're working on something like self-driving cars, where there's just this you know, massive high dimensional data distribution that you're trying to sample from, right? you're in this long tail distribution, then it can be really hard to sample a good test set that actually represents all the performance characteristics that you want your model to have. Another cause of training data being different from production data is data drift, right? So this is when the, the data set that, um, the data that's going into your model actually changes over time, maybe as a result of your user's behavior changing, um, or even as a result of your users changing what they do because of the predictions that your model is making. And then, you know, in addition to, to data drift due to, you know, users changing their behavior, sometimes users will be malicious and they'll try to actually um, intentionally cause your model to produce bad results. And then finally, like the last thing that I'll say is that you know, even if you get the rest of this stuff right, um, if you're, if you're, um, you know, if you keep working on other parts of your code base, 
and you can't come back and actually reproduce the model that you that you use to get this performance, then that can cause problems down the road. And so that's also really common, right? You lose the ability to recreate a model that is running in production right now, which can be very dangerous. And so I kind of want to, um, con so that's that's like, I basically just threw a bunch of stuff at you that can go wrong and does go wrong in practice. Um, and so, you know, you might be thinking like, yeah, this is, um, all this stuff is really scary, right? So like companies must have um, figured out really good ways of dealing with this. And um, I'm sorry to, uh, to disappoint and tell you that at most companies, the, the state of test machine learning testing is, um, is really not that great. And I think that one of the core reasons for that is a cultural problem, right? So um, I think that there's kind of two common ways that a lot of companies go about building machine learning teams, right? So one is um, on the left, what I would what I would call like the, um, the cowboy ML engineer model, right? Um, and so the cowboy ML engineer is, you know, is in organizations where like they think, you know, okay, we're not gonna um, like data scientists don't um, necessarily write production ready code, but um, they, but that's okay. Like we still need them to ship models, right? And so you end up with really bad practices where you'll have data scientists that are not, you know, not the best software engineers in the world, but are responsible sh for shipping models and are like doing really bad production practices around them. Um, and then on the other side of, of the fence, I think a lot of companies deal with this problem of, you know, data scientists not being that good at writing um, software engineering code by saying like, okay, you know, um, we're gonna have, we're not gonna have um, cowboy ML engineers, we're gonna have ivory tower data scientists, right? So like you as a data scientist, your job is to train models. And we're gonna give you these nice data sets and you're gonna just like train the best model that you can on these data sets. Um, and then when you're done, you're gonna toss that over the wall to some other team and that other team is gonna be responsible for productionizing them. And I think this is a, a sort of a cultural challenge in the field right now and I think is at the root cause of why um, testing ML systems is so hard for most companies, right? Because either you're in a situation where you have folks that aren't really experienced at um, software testing and software monitoring who are responsible for it and maybe just don't care that much about it, or you have a handoff and both of those can introduce friction. Okay, so that's kind of setting the scene for where I think the state of testing machine learning models is at most companies right now. Um, and so what I wanna cover in the rest of the talk is First, I wanna talk about, you know, when we say testing machine learning models, what do we even mean by that, right? Like what are the different ways that you can test machine learning models and machine learning systems? Um, then I wanna talk a little bit about operationalizing those tests, right? So um, like, how do you actually make sure that these tests are getting run as part of the work that you're doing as, a, as an ML team or as a data science team? And then lastly, I wanna just like very briefly tough on, touch on what I see as some kind of open questions, right? And I think, one of the other reasons that this is a hard thing for companies to get right is that there's um, there are theoretical questions here that, in my opinion, haven't really been answered um, in a satisfactory way yet. Okay, so I, I just dumped a lot of information at you. Let me let me pause here and just see if there's any kind of early questions on the setup or uh, you know what the goal here is or what we're going to try to cover. So at the moment, there's only one question. Who else is a cowboy data scientist? <laughs> um, I don't well, think you've given any specific examples and maybe it's not a good idea to point fingers, but... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, I've never point fingers at any companies, but um, I've heard some stories of, you know, um, of folks where like, you know, you, you ask them like, hey, so, um, okay, you're responsible for productionizing your models. You're responsible for actually the entire model end to end. So finding the right data, training the model, deploying that model into production and maintaining it, right? That's great. So like, okay, tell me about how you deploy the model. Um, well, you know, I, I, uh, I pickle my model and then I write a little flask app and then I, you know, I, I deploy that model behind a web server somewhere. And it's like, okay, well, how do you, how do you deal with scaling that model? Like if, um, you know, if all of a sudden traffic increases, like how do you think about like, what happens if the data distribution changes and all of a sudden, you know, the assumptions that you made when you train the model don't, um, uh, aren't met anymore. And you'll get answers like, oh, you know, I, well, I assume that someone would like tell me about it at that point. Like one of our users would, would point out the fact that it's broken. Um, so that's kind of like, that's sort of the attitude that I mean when I, when I call out um, cowboy uh, 
data scientists. Um, and it's, it's kind of, it's a very pervasive attitude in some corners of the field where, um, you know, people have gotten in their, in their head that like, only, like everyone in the organization should be responsible for shipping models, which I don't necessarily think is a, um, is a bad attitude to have because the opposite can also be, can also really slow you down. Um, but I do think that, you know, if you're going to do that, then you want to make sure that you have um, really good tools and practices around making sure that you're doing that in a safe and responsible way. And uh, I've got a question uh, related to like your uh, earlier slide about the two failure modes of uh, organizing ML teams. And can you provide some uh, examples or uh, or mention what you think is the right way of organizing uh, an ML team? And uh, is there more than one way of uh, doing that? Yeah, I think there's more than one way of doing it. I think um, I see the best practice as being combining these two things. Um, and combining these two things um, and also having really good infrastructure. So I think that like in the companies that do this really well, um, they have they often have a centralized machine learning team who, you know, most of their job is really training models. Um, but then though that team is not isolated. It's not just like, yeah, any ML problem in the org gets given to that team and then, you know, they solve it in isolation and then hand it back off. Um, they also have um, data scientists or ML engineers that sit in the different product functions and um, make sure that more pragmatic problems are getting surfaced and solve a lot of those problems themselves. Um, and then I think the other kind of the other way around this is to have really good in infrastructure around deployment, so that you know if your um, if your if your main job is to be a data scientist, and um, you know you also uh, and you you know you, you need to hand off your model at some point to someone who's going to maintain it. The the more that you can do on that process, so like the the closer you can get to turning your you know, research artifacts into a working production system on your own, um, the less painful that handoff is going to be. And so I think that like, when you, when you think about companies that have a lot of models in production, right, like the, you know, Ubers and Lyfts um, and, um, uh, you know, stitch fixes of the world, like they've invested a lot in infrastructure so that, you know, um, most data scientists are able to get through a lot of that process on their own. Okay. So uh, that, uh... <laughs> that actually brings up an, another question like uh, for me, if you're saying that uh, kind of data scientists and ML engineers heavily rely on uh, kind of a data infrastructure being there in a good state, uh, would you say that uh, that affects kind of the order of uh, when different types of roles are hired? Like, would you say that data engineers should be kind of the first hires when the company is planning to start using machine learning? And then over time, when the infrastructure is at least like some parts of the infrastructure infrastructure are there, then uh, the company can start moving towards hiring uh, kind of machine learning people. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. And I think it's something that a lot of companies uh, got wrong when they first started investing in machine learning. Um, I think that when you're serious about machine learning, right, like when you're re really ready to make an investment in um, making this a big part of your organization, then uh, data infrastructure is the thing that you should do first. And um, almost no organization actually does it in that order. But um, uh, but like, I think that's the right order to do it in. The caveat I would say is that like, if, um, you know, a lot of times, like if you need to build support for using machine learning within an organization, it, it could make sense to um, build a data science or an ML team first, get them to prototype some things, um, create some proofs of concept, and just like demonstrate that this is going to be valuable. Um, but I think there the key is like, not waiting too long between like when you have, you know, proof of concept, like, yeah, this, this feels like it could help us a lot. Uh, not waiting too long between that and then going out and actually building the data, data infrastructure that you need to make these things sort of repeatable and maintainable. Okay. And we got one more question from our audience and then uh, we'll move on. So uh, Michael is asking what kind of issues arise for uh, production models in regulated industries, such as healthcare, finance, insurance, uh, that deal with models that need to be audited? Yeah, um, it's a good question. So, I mean, it, I think there's um, there's a whole field around this and I'm not really an expert in uh, in regulations around deploying models in regulated industries. So I, I'm probably not the right person to ask about this, but um, I think, you know, some, some of the lessons that we talk about here are like, uh, are general principles that you can apply to um, the types of tests that regulators want you to run on your models. Um, I'll put it that way. All right. Thanks.
Great. Um, so I'll dive into types of tests that you can run on your models. Um, so the first, I'll, I'll sort of situate the types of tests that you might think about running in the context of where they live in, you know, in the outline of your machine learning system as a whole, right? So the core of your machine learning system is um, what I would call a prediction system. And so the what a prediction system does is it you know, takes your input data, um, constructs a network with trained weights, and uses that network, um, you know, if it is a neural network or or some other model, to make predictions. Um, one way you can think of the prediction system is it's the output of a training system, right? And so the training system takes raw data, it runs experiments like training jobs, it manages the results, and then um, eventually turns those results into a prediction system. Um, and then finally, like the, the third component that I would articulate here is um, the serving system, right? And so the serving system takes your prediction system, right? So this function that maps input data to predictions, and it serves it um, in production and scales it up and down to meet demand. Um, and so, you know, uh, training data and validation data, um, you know, in addition to your training system are the inputs that create the prediction system. And then your serving system consumes production data to make its predictions. And so now I'm going to talk about different types of tests and sort of where they, they're, where they're situated in the rest, in kind of the infrastructure of your machine learning project as a whole. So the first kind of test that I'll, I'll mention is infrastructure tests. Um, and these are meant to test the functionality of your training system, right? So whether your training system can train models in the way that you think it can. Um, there's a few different types of infrastructure tests, uh, single batch tests, which essentially take, um, uh, run your training system on a single batch of data to make sure that you can, you know, with your training function can overfit that single batch of data. Uh, there are tests that do full training runs Right, so um, actually take a problem that you care about and train your model from scratch. Make sure that you can still reach the performance that you were able to reach when you know when you got the model that you're happy with. Um, there's you know typical unit tests, and the goal of all of these is to catch regressions in um, in you know the code and infrastructure that makes up the training system. And you know some of these tests are things that you'll want to run as you're developing the training system, and some like the full training runs are things that you'll run more um, infrequently. And we'll talk about kind of how to think about when to run which tests when we talk about operationalizing tests. So the next category of tests that I want to mention are tests that sit at the intersection of your training system and your prediction system. And I would call these functionality tests, right? Um, and so the goal here is to um, catch code regressions on the prediction system itself. And so the types of tests that you'll see here are um, you know, test your prediction system, right? So test your train model um, and all of the like pre-processing and post-processing that goes along with it on a few key examples, right? So um, maybe examples that you really want to make sure that the system gets right or examples that have been, you know, that have caused problems with your system in the past or just examples that you think are representative of what most of the data in your um, real distribution are going to look like. But the goal here is for these functionality tests to run um, quickly in like less less than five minutes, let's say. Um, and the reason for that is because these are things that you want to run during development, right? So as you're um, as you're sort of improving your training system, as you're like making changes to your prediction system, um, implementing new types of models, running experiments, um, when you make changes to your code, you run functionality tests to make sure that you don't break what you could do before. The third category of tests is tests of the prediction system itself. And so these are called validation tests, right? Um, and the goal here is to catch regressions on the performance of your trained model. Um, and so again, as I sort of alluded to before, the, the key thing to know here is that you should think about this as more than just your validation score. Um, and we'll talk about some of the other things that you might want to measure with validation tests, but this is sort of where you'd run tests that um, that look at all of the slices of data and all of the metrics that you really care about your prediction system performing well on. Okay, next are tests that sit at the intersection of prediction system and serving system. Right, so these are tests that you'll run when you're ready to deploy your prediction system into production. Um, and I'll call these deployment tests. And the goal, is, the goal here is to catch um, you know, some bugs that only show up when um, your system is deployed into production. And you know be before those bugs affect your users. And then lastly, there's tests of the serving system itself, 
Um, and so, you know, another word for this is monitoring, right? And so the, the idea here is to alert you to changes um, in the performance of your system once it's already in production, right? So to as quickly as possible, know when something broke in your serving system so you can go in and fix it. Okay, then the next thing I'm gonna do, um, actually maybe I'll, I'll just pause quickly here and just see if there's any questions on like these categories of tests. Um, and if not, then I'm gonna go and um, talk about a few of these in a little bit more detail. There was a question about testing and um, it is, what is your opinion on fuzz testing? On fuzz testing? Um, if I, if I understand correctly, fuzz testing is when you um, provide like completely random or um, unrealistic or um, yeah. um, e examples essentially that make no sense, makes make no sense. Um, yeah, so I, I think fuzz testing is like an interesting tool to have in the toolkit. Um, and the place that I would probably put that in is like under deployment tests, right? So it's like, it's something that you can run to just check, to just give yourself a sense check of like, um, okay, are there any, is there anything that could show up in production that I'm not really accounting for in my validation set right now? Um, so, you know, for example, like if you, um, you know, for whatever reason, your validation set like doesn't have any, um, any examples with like a particular feature value that's like at the minimum range that you could possibly see. But when you do see feature values at that minimum possible range, it like causes everything to like nan out and bug your system. Um, that's the sort of thing that you could catch with fuzz testing. So I don't, I haven't actually seen that many people use it in practice other than, um, other than Google. Um, and so I think it's like, it's something to be aware of, but it's not something I would prioritize um, implementing. I don't think we have any more questions about the testing, so we can move cool. on. And yeah. Well, we're going to like talk in more detail about yeah, uh, a lot sorry. of these. So, um, the first one I want to double click on is validation tests, right? So um, again, like the the keyword, the like catchphrase here is validation tests are more than just your validation score. So like, what else? What else do you want to test here? Um, so almost always you want to evaluate more than just um, a single metric, right? So um, you know, if if you if the like single number that you're trying to drive down when you are experimenting and trying to improve model performance is something like, you know, like some some validation loss, then here's where you might start to like think about how you trade off precision and recall and things like that, um, uh, or like start to take into account latency or like other model performance metrics, cost of running inference. Um, you almost always also want to evaluate your data, not just in aggregate on your validation set, but also on multiple slices of that data. So some, some ideas here, which will depend a little bit on your problem, but you might want to slice important users. You might want to slice um, classes that you don't want to bias against. Right? So if you don't want your model to be gender biased or biased against anything else. Um, you might also want to slice um, cohorts or like edge cases that have had poor, poor performance in the past, right? So if you um, if if you're working on your model and one day you realize that like your self-driving car does a really bad job at left turns in the rain, um, then you might want to create like a little slice of of data that you run as part of your validation tests of left turns in the rain, so that when you train you know train another model two months from now, um, you're not going to accidentally reintroduce the bug that you had before. So in use cases where predictions themselves are safety critical, um, so again, like self-driving cars is kind of the operating example there, or will be shown to users, right? So where um, you know your user's opinion of those predictions matters, then one thing you can consider doing is doing qualitative error analysis. Um, and what that means is you just you know manually look at the recommendations that the model is making if it's a recommendation system or you know, maybe the mistakes that the model is making if it's something like a classifier and just consider like, are these are these reasonable mistakes for the model to be making? And are these mistakes that I would expect it to make? Or are there like error categories that um, that seem concerning and seem like out of the ordinary or, or wouldn't have been things that the last model um, made, right? And so again, this is a manual step. And so, um, you know, if, if your model is not really safety critical, then you can probably skip this. And there are tools out there, like um, one is called the what if tool from Google that, you know, their job is to allow you to kind of 
um, look through your data set and surface slices of the data that have poor performance. And so that's kind of another way that you can go about doing this qualitative error analysis. So some machine learning models, um, having a static test set is not enough because your model affects the world that it's interacting with. Um, so this is really common in like robotics, for example, right? Where, um, you know, if uh, like, if let's say you're training a perception model for a robot, right? The, that, the output of that perception model is fed into a controller and that controller decides what the robot's gonna do next. Um, and so if your perception system is bad, then the controller might do the wrong thing. And that might change the data, right? Like it might, um, you know, push the object it's trying to interact with off of the table, let's say. Um, and so that could mean that the data that you collected is not actually really that representative of what will have what will happen um, in the real world when you're actually taking action um, in a way that depends on the model. Um, and so if you're in a case like that, um, recommender systems are also often another case like that. Then it's worth considering whether you can simulate um, the actual. Uh, uh, roll out of the behavior of the system um, as a whole to see what happens. And, you know, can't always do that, but if you can, um, like in autonomous systems, then simulating is a good idea. And autonomous vehicle companies have invested a lot in simulations for this exact reason. And then lastly, um, if you're doing NLP or if your data has some sort of predictable structure to it, you can consider doing expectation tests. Um, what expectation tests are, are they say like, let me take an individual data point and let me change that data point in a way where I know I can predict how that should change the output of the model, right? So for example, let's say that you're doing sentiment classification and um, you, have a you have a sentence that's um, classified as positive sentiment. Well, then if you take one of the words in that sentence and you make that word itself more positive in sentiment, then that shouldn't change the classifier's performance. Um, so that's an example of an expectation test. And um, this kind of mostly applies to NLP and is something that I think is um, not really considered a best practice yet, but is like an emerging technique. And so if you're working in NLP, this is um, something that's worth exploring more. Okay, um, any, any questions on validation tests before I move on? Um, have you ever tried um, testing against adversarial attacks? Is there any interest in that outside of academia or autonomous vehicles? Mm. Um, it's it's a good question. I think uh, there's definitely interest in it. I'm not sure. Um, I don't know of any sort of like documented examples of adversarial attacks actually affecting like real world production machine learning systems. Um, so I think maybe if it's not talked about that much, that, that might be one of the reasons why. Um, I think that um, my general opinion, like I think defense against adversarial examples is uh, a rapidly moving field. And I, my general opinion is that it's not really uh, possible yet to defend against adversarial examples. Um, like generally there are defenses, but generally like someone who's, um, someone who's good at creating adversarial examples can get around them. Um, so I would say you know, maybe not to be too negative here, but I think that like um, you can do things to per, to defend against like basic adversarial examples, um, but they're like no machine learning system or at least no deep learning system is really fully safe. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of more, a uh, couple more questions. One is uh, what tools do you recommend for all this testing? Is PyTest good enough? And how do you feel about testing code in notebooks? Yeah, um, I think, uh, testing code in notebooks is probably not a good idea. Um, generally, like you want your tests to be things that are very repeatable and, you know, you can run them um, every time you push code um, or every time that you're ready to deploy or every time that you train a new model. Um, like you should be, they should be things that you can trigger. And there are ways to set up notebooks to run that way. But um, generally, I think that's like not really the, um, the thing that notebooks are useful for. Um, and in terms of tools, I, I mentioned the what if analysis tool, like for um, for sort of qualitative error analysis. Um, I think most folks that are doing this, like just use existing software testing frameworks and CI frameworks. Um, and there are limitations of those frameworks for machine learning. Like they're not really, 
um, always the best suited for it, but I don't think that there's good specialized tools out there yet. Mm -hmm. And one last question before we move on. Um, why do you put unit tests in infrastructure tests? Unit testing should be isolated from any infra external concerns, right? As for me, your infra test would be in functional slash integration. So um, the reason why I put unit tests in infrastructure is because like your code base is like in this diagram, um, The vast majority of your code base is in um, is in your training system, right? So this is where you like define your training loop and define like all of your model abstractions and things like that. Um, and so those are the things that you're unit testing. Um, your prediction system is really just like a little bit of code that wraps a trained model. Um, and so you should have some unit tests there to make sure that um, to make sure that like there's no regressions to the code that wraps the trained model. But like when I think of like traditional unit testing, it's testing code, not testing um, uh, testing models and data. And that's kind of why we need to, to talk about more categories of testing. Yeah, it makes sense. There's actually one more question which is very relevant to this last slide that you're showing right now. And so this is gonna be the last one. Okay, this slide. <laughs> um, yeah. All right, um, yeah. So can you explain a little more on expectation tests? For example, for word vectors, how would we do it? Uh, I don't know on word vectors specifically, like the general idea of expectation tests is that um, if your machine learning problem is set up in such a way that you uh, like changing your inputs should have a predictable impact on your outputs, then that's when you use expectation tests, right? So um, like an another example other than sentiment could be like, um, uh, I don't know, like um, let's say that you're um, predicting whether there's like, um, I don't know, more, more than a certain number of like objects in an image. And uh, you already have like a classification that says that there's more than, you know, X object, objects in this image. And you have a way of adding additional object to the image. Um, then you could do an expectation test that says like, cool, like whatever the model says, you know, um, the, the model's prediction shouldn't change when we add additional object to the image. All right, we're out of questions for now, cool. so let's move on. <laughs> All right, so next I'm gonna talk about um, deployment tests. And so again, these are these are tests that catch bugs that only show up in production. Um, and so, you know, maybe another way to think about this is like, really the way that you're gonna do this is you're gonna test in production, but like you're gonna try to test in production without the pain. Um, so one way you can do this is through offline online consistency tests. So you can take your um, deployed model before you start serving predictions to users. You can run um, a data set through that model, make sure it produces the same results as your offline model. Um, really simple thing, but like we'll actually catch bugs. Back testing, right? So um, you can take, well, like once you've deployed your model in your production environment, before you start sending predictions to users, you can um, run that production model on historical data and make sure that the predictions that it's making are um, accurate if you have labels, or maybe are just not too different than the models, than the predictions that the production model at the time made. Um, hardware in the loop testing, right? So if, you, if you're uh, working in an environment where you deploy your model um, in an edge system, then a good idea is to make sure that as part of your testing somewhere, you run the model on the actual hardware that it's gonna be running on in production. Next, you have shadow mode, right? So shadow mode is where you um, take your production model, your new production model, and you start forking traffic to that model, right? So your old production model still actually returns the predictions to your users, but you're also sending that traffic to the new production model. And then you can start to do things like comparing, like is the new production model making relatively similar predictions to the existing production model? Um, and then like once you've sort of done these other tests, you've done some offline online consistency, you've done some back testing, hardware in the loop if it's applicable, shadow mode, um, then you can run, consider running an A-B test, right? So you send a small percentage of traffic to the new model um, and compare actual performance between the old and new model. And then like lastly, once you've done the, all these things, you can start to gradually roll out traffic to the new production model. 
Okay, um, lastly, or I guess not lastly, but the last um, kind, of, kind of test that I'll dive into is uh, monitoring. And um, the, way I, the way I would think about like the goal in monitoring is, um, you know, really the thing that you're trying to catch is, um, you know, like once you're, once you're confident that your model is like should be perf performing well on the data that you um, trained it on or, and that you think represents the production data, um, your goal is to catch any changes to that data that would cause the model not to perform well on it as early as in the system as possible. And so there's different kind of stages when you can catch it, right? So you can catch the bad data before the request comes into the model um, or like later, right? And so um, you can, like in a lot of cases, you can um, you can actually catch the, the bad data before your model sends a bad prediction back to the user, right? And so these types of tests are um, data validation tests, right? And so the goal here is to check whether the data has the form that you expect, right? So are all of the features that you expect to be present present? Do they all have the correct data types? Maybe are the features within some allowable ranges? Um, maybe are the predictions within some allowable ranges, right? And so these are kind of like hard and fast rules that you can just say like, okay, if the data doesn't take this form, then we shouldn't even send a prediction back to the user because this is clearly bad data. Um, another thing that you can do relatively quickly once you once you get start getting data into your model um, is outlier detection. And so the outlier detection asks the question of like, how unlikely is it that this data point that is going through my model now is something that I would have seen in, in the distribution that I trained my model on? Um, so there's off-the-shelf libraries that can help you with this. Um, these are two. And this, a um, couple of things to note here. One is that this tends to work well when you have a small number of um, relatively uncorrelated features, but it doesn't work as well for high dimensional data. Um, other thing that's worth mentioning here is I think a lot of times when people think about doing outlier detection, one sort of natural thing to do is to say like, okay, let's look at the model's confidence. If the model's confidence is below a certain threshold, then um, we'll call this an outlier. But in reality, like model's confidence is a pretty unreliable um, way of telling whether the data point is in distribution or not. Um, and then like the last thing I'll say here is that um, one of the reasons why I don't recommend running outlier detection before you send a prediction back to the user is that tuning outlier detection systems to the, you know, um, trigger on the right um, data points is tricky. So I think a better use of outlier detection is to say like, let's just have this as a signal that we as um, model developers can use to kind of get a sense of whether our models are performing well, um, but not actually blocking predictions going back to users. Okay, so once you've had like some statistically, statistically significant number of predictions go through your model, you can start to look um, at drift detection, right? So if anomaly detection is, say, is asking the question of like, is this particular data point likely to have come from the training distribution? Then skew detection or drift detection is asking the question of like, does, does recent data look like past data, right? So does this window of data look like the data that I trained on? Um, and there's different ways that you can do this, different measures of distribution distance. Um, you can do it qualitatively um, and you can do it both for the input data to your model and the predictions that the model is creating. Um, and one other thing that I'll note here is that um, again, like there aren't really well-established best practices for doing this when you're working with higher dimensional, um, more unstructured data like images or text. And then lastly, you know, for a lot of machine learning problems, but not all machine learning problems, you're, you're able to actually get some ground truth estimate of performance about how well your model is doing, um, sometimes much later, right? So sometimes like in the case of, um, of fraud detection, you might not know whether this is a, a positive label or a negative label for months. And so, you know, in general, the last thing that you'll be able to do is evaluate the, the performance of your model. Um, and so, you know, ideally, if you can, you wanna capture your user's behavior and use this to kind of automatically label your data. Um, if not, then you might consider taking a subset of your data, setting that off to a labeling service. Um, and in some cases, like, you know, when you can get this signal, this is the best signal to tell you whether data is bad in production. Um, and it's so important to do this when you can that in some use, in some cases it's it's worth having some sub suboptimality of your model in order to um, 
be able to measure performance, right? So um, companies that do fraud detection have told me that they will sort of intentionally let some potentially fraudulent transactions through, like a very small percentage of them, um, so that they can go back and get labels for those transactions and tell whether the model's predictions were right or not, like whether they should let those transactions through. Cool. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause here, and I would love to like kind of take any more questions about different types of tests. And I realize that I'm sort of running a bit long, so um, I'll like once we've um, talked through any questions here, then I'll I'll kind of quickly go through a, a couple of thoughts on operationalizing tests and some open questions. But I won't really dwell on those parts. Uh, okay. So uh, there's actually been quite an uh, interesting discussion about. Uh, expectation testing that you mentioned earlier. Okay. Specifically, uh, one person in uh, our audience mentioned a recent paper. Uh, I think it was uh, like in, from May uh, this year uh, from a few researchers from Microsoft and University of Washington. The paper's titled Beyond Accuracy, Behavioral Testing of NLP Models with Checklist. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I don't know if you are familiar with that paper. I just yeah, I, I, know, I know that paper. I think that's like that's sort of the reference on that type of testing. And I think um, yeah, that, that's that's where I would go to learn more about this. And um, I think it's not really like an established idea in industry yet, but um, it's an exciting direction. Right. Uh, so uh, a few people mentioned that this uh, this library, I presume, uh, supports kind of. Uh, both like in invariance uh, testing so that the predictions are kind of stable if you uh, change the inputs just ever so slightly and then that the direction of the prediction is uh, uh, mm -hmm. basically what you described if you change the inputs in a certain direction and you uh, it conforms to your expectation when the model produces the outputs yep okay and uh one of the question is about um so uh Sarah is asking your opinion, which of these tests should run on data that is of uh, the expected size or scale like used in production versus a smaller version of the input data? A smaller version of the input data. Does that mean like the inputs themselves are projected to a lower dimensional space or does that mean like taking only a subset of the input data? Um, I think it's uh, talking about the subset. Got it. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I think like practically speaking, you probably, if your system has scale, um, I mean, so it, it's all dependent on the scale of your system, right? But I think in a lot of cases, it's not practical to um, store and reuse every single data point that you see in production. Um, and so I think like, you, you know, generally speaking, your validation tests are, um, you know, you are not going to be run on all of your historical data. But if you don't have very much historical data, then you can just run your validation tests. Like one of your tests can be running on all historical data. Um, for deployment tests, I think you you definitely don't need to run on all of your data. And for monitoring, I think it just depends on scale. Like it can be it can be useful to run on all of your data. Um, but you know, again, like if you're um, if you're like operating at web scale. Or if you're like Tesla, then you, it's probably too expensive to monitor every single data point to be worth it. Um, so you could consider subsampling that data, and um, you know, randomly subsampling the data is like probably a reasonable baseline. And I think, like, um, but I think we'll we'll start to uh, can cause you to make some wrong um, inferences if you're not careful. So, like, if you need to subsample data, I think it's worth thinking carefully about how you can subsample data to make sure that you're getting um, data from all of the sort of slices and categories that you care about monitoring. Okay. Uh, we also have uh, not so much as a question, but a, a request uh, for you to write a book on uh, testing and monitoring. <laughs> uh, okay, maybe, yeah. Well, we might, we might write a full stack deep learning book at some point and, uh, and this, I guess, would be part of it. Um, I think, yeah, like the you know the part of the reason for for uh, for giving this talk is like we're we're always trying to improve the um, like all the different pieces of that course, and so this is this is one of the things I think if you've gone through previous versions of the course, we haven't really given enough love to, and so I'm working on making this uh, this section better. Yeah, and uh, so one uh, final uh, question, uh, and then uh, we'll go. So uh, Michael is uh, asking for any recommendations on how to explain or deal with uh, kind of non-deterministic uh, 
non non determinism in machine learning uh, when dealing with uh, kind of QA and other st stakeholders. Yeah. Uh, basically, when tests uh, exhibit different behaviors for the same input. So I presume that if you have like if QA has some kind of uh, unit tests where they pass the same inputs to the model, but then you change the model, and for that particular input, it produces a different output. Like, how do you go about explaining that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, well, there's there's a couple of like potential issues that are baked in there. That's one. Um, I think there it's a little bit easier because I think like when you're changing the model, like you should like the predictions should change. Um, and so that's kind of a, that, that feels like it should be relatively easy to articulate because it's like, yeah, it's like, um, I mean, our models changed, you know, that, that was the whole point of training a new model. But like the question is whether it's better. Um, I think the trickier thing uh, for dealing with non-deterministic tests is that for tests that involve training the model. Um, and so there it's kind of like the hard thing is that like it's, it's tricky to make um, machine learning training runs deterministic. And so if you have non-deterministic training and you, you know, you have a, you have a test that involves training a model overnight and um, you train that model overnight and like performance is not as good as, you know, what it was the first time that you trained the model. Does that mean that like, does that mean that the model, like there's some regression in your code base and your training system is broken? Or does that mean that like you just picked the wrong random seed and you got unlucky? Um, so those are the harder ones to deal with. And I would say like the piece of advice I have there are, um, to like fight against this idea that machine learning has to be non-deterministic. Um, so it is possible to make training runs deterministic. Like you have to be really careful about setting all the right random seeds and all that stuff. But um, that's like, that's kind of one, that's the first thing I would do is like, just sort of get rid of this mindset that everything is going to be non-deterministic. Um, and then the second thing is like, just very tactically, like if there are places where it's just not really worth your time to make something deterministic, um, if the test itself is relatively cheap to run, you can do a few runs in average. Um, uh, I think that like be having more statistical rigor about like knowing when de non-deterministic tests um, indicate a degradation in like in real performance of a system is um, something that's probably not really worth your time, but like hopefully will get baked into a tool someday. So you can just like, you know, you can just like fire off your tests and then you can get like a, like a P value as to like whether this, whether this test passed or not. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we're ready to move on. Cool. Um, I think I'll, I guess we'll just try to wrap up by uh, by seven. Um, so let me talk quickly about operationalizing tests, right? So th that's kind of like high level of what are the types of things you might want to consider testing. So now, how do you actually go about doing this as an organization? Um, a few prerequisites to have in mind. Um, maybe these are like not even worth mentioning, but I'll mention them anyway. Um, you need to make sure your team is bought into the idea of doing this. Um, I think, you know, if if they're not, then like you're gonna have trouble, um, like once those tests start failing, you know, people are gonna, people are gonna want to um, just like go ahead and commit their code anyway. And so you need to make sure that the team is bought in and that you're, you have an organizational norm around enforcing um, test passing every time that you uh, do, you know, pull requests and do a code review. So the next thing I'll mention on operationalizing is just like, you know, th there's a bunch of different types of tests there. So like, how should you think about frequency of running tests? Um, there's some tests that you should run frequently during development, like whenever you're training, you're changing your training or um, or model or, mo or model code. And that's like the functionality tests, uh, single batch infrastructure tests, if you're doing anything that touches the training code. Um, then the next most frequent type of test that you could run is like tests that run every time um, that you're you know, pushing new code to your repo. And so here I would recommend running your functionality tests again, um, maybe even like a broader set of functionality tests than you are running frequently during development. Um, your single batch infrastructure tests, um, even if you don't think you touch the training code, a subset of your validation tests. So like a bigger data set than your functionality tests, but still something that's designed to run relatively quickly, like within five minutes or so. Um, because one thing that I've noticed is that um, people hate their, you know, their code pushes and their pull reviews being blocked on tests taking hours to run. So like try to get these things into, you know, 10 minutes. Um, then there's a set of a tests that you can't really run within five minutes. So you shouldn't block pushing new code, um, but you still should run these tests 
frequently. Um, and so like every night is a good way to do it. And that's your full training infrastructure test. So like actually training models, um, your full validation tests, um, and, and like just making sure that like everything is still healthy, uh, you know, after all the, the code changes that you push during the day. And then finally, before you promote a full, a new model, you should again, run your full validation tests and uh, any deployment tests that you have. Um, I'll kind of breeze through this. There's a bunch of tools that we, we sort of mentioned briefly already that help you do um, testing in uh, CI for traditional software. Um, here are some of them. And uh, you know, generally, like they're pretty good, but they're not super well suited to machine learning. So you might need to hack them a little bit. Um, there's for monitoring, there's tools around like system monitoring, which are useful, but, um, they're not really like typically, typically very well suited to monitoring data distributions. And this is kind of like, um, I think like an underserved need in the machine learning tooling world right now. There's um, a handful of startups that are popping up to tackle it. Um, Domino data lab has an offering for example, and there's others. And then lastly, just very briefly, I want to touch on what I think are like kind of some of the, the core open questions for testing machine learning models. Um, so the first one I'll mention is um, code coverage for machine learning, right? So we talked about like a whole litany of different tests that you might want to consider running um, on your machine learning models. And like a very natural reaction to have is that like this feels kind of overwhelming, right? There's so many things that we need to check. Um, I think that's true right now. I think like one of the things that's nice about software testing is that we have this metric called code coverage that is, um, you know, everyone recognizes is imperfect, but it's a decent enough proxy for how well your code is tested that like you can you can think about like looking at your code coverage as giving you a reasonable sense for um, how well you're testing your code. And so I think one open question is like, what does code coverage look like for machine learning? Um, there's a couple of sort of first stabs at this, um, a paper from Google, um, and which is which is sort of a qualitative version of this. Um, uh, someone asked a question about fuzzing. So there's um, TensorFuzz is another kind of um, attempt at, at a, you know, a, a single metric that can drive your, your testing and machine learning models. But I don't think that there's really a, an established answer here yet. So the second thing that I'll mention is monitoring high dimensional data. So I mentioned this a couple of times, right? Like, Typically outlier detection and drift detection algorithms work well when you have a small number of relatively uncorrelated features. When you're working with images, when you're working with test, uh, text, anything uh, high dimensional and correlated, these algorithms don't tend to do very well. Um, so this is a paper that I, I recommend checking out on this if you're interested, but I don't think this is a solved problem yet. Um, efficient selection of test sets, right? So there was a question of, you know, how do you, like, when do you use all of your historical data versus um, using only a subset of it? And I think kind of a question, like a sort of part of the answer that I sweep, swept under the rug a little bit is that, you know, if you're subsampling your historical data to create your test sets, how do you decide what subset of your data you should select to be part of your test set? Um, and I don't think that there's really an established answer to this question either. Um, I think like randomly subsampling is probably not enough because you know, you can get a very good idea of how well your model performs on um, big chunks of your data using a small number of data points. But there's, you know, in a lot of machine learning use cases, there's all these like edge cases and sort of weird corners that you also want to test. And so like, is there a way, is there, are there principles or is there maybe even an algorithmic way of selecting those test sets to, um, to run your model on? Um, another open question that I'll call out is, doing this, like doing testing and debugging and monitoring in a federated way, right? Where, you know, you don't actually, you're not allowed to look at your user's data. Um, so I think algorithms for this um, are an open question. And then uh, maybe, I think this is the last one that I'll mention is automatic error analysis, right? So in a couple of places we talked about like looking at errors, um, mistakes that your model makes and trying to understand like, okay, is why is the model making this mistake? Um, so I would love to see better algorithms and better tools for sort of automatically servicing subsets of your data where um, your model is not performing well and helping you understand like where should we be collecting more data or designing new features or um, putting more money into labeling so that we can sort of smooth out these error cases. 
Um, and then, yeah, I just wanted to leave a couple of um, a couple of resources about where to go to learn more about this topic. Um, we mentioned our course a couple of times, um, teaching an updated version of it as an undergrad class at Berkeley this coming semester. And so we'll be releasing all the materials from that. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll put some effort into like making things better and um, adding the latest tools and all that stuff. Um, and then, you know, mention some papers in this talk. I'm happy to share the slides with anyone who's interested. Um, and so it's, it's worth uh, taking a look at some of those as well. Okay. Um, that's all I have. I'm happy to kind of, I, I think we've been going for like an hour. So I think that's maybe a little longer than I was intending to go. Um, but I'm happy to kind of um, hang out and, and answer questions that, that folks have um, uh, if it's helpful. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we had uh, quite a few questions. So uh, uh, I wanted to uh, ask you about maybe elaborate a little bit more about the the course in terms of like and describe th three things like uh, what's the uh, target audience for the course. Uh, I think people sort of from your presentation got the idea of what uh, the course contents are, but can you also mention what you, uh, you will not be covering in that course? Yeah, so um, the course is really um, not intended to be a first course in machine learning. Um, so, you know, the, the prerequisite, like, not that you won't be able to understand what's happening if you don't have this, but like, the, the prerequisite, I think, for finding it interesting would be um, having done, um, you know, like a machine learning course before, like whether it's, you know, Andrew Ng's course or something like that. Um, and ideally, probably having taken a deep learning class, just because that's where most of the examples that we pull come from. Um, I think I would say like maybe only 20% of the course is specific to deep learning. So um, if you haven't taken deep learning or you're not, you know, if most of your work involves traditional machine learning and maybe you're not that excited about deep learning, um, I still think you'll get something out of it. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, really like the, the folks that I think will find this most interesting are like people who are trying to um, either right now as part of their job or like want to make this part of their job. We're trying to like ship machine learning systems into production, right? So like trying to take models and turn those into um, uh, production systems that like serve predictions to users, um, internal or external users um, in a production system. All right, thank you. Um, Maria? I have a question uh, going back uh, to the beginning to the cowboy data scientist and ivory tower. And um, I've met people who have different approaches to organizing the process. And let's say some people prefer when there's a new task to start with uh, some sort of baseline or prototype or whatever, and then just to prove that, uh, you know, it's going to work um, and then figure out how to deploy this. And then there are other people who um, decide to first build up the, the infrastructure and the pipeline and then go to prototyping phase. Yeah. Do you think one way is better than the other, or is there a middle ground that combining the best of the both worlds? I don't think one is better than the other in every circumstance. Um, I think that if you can, you're better off getting some system into production, even if that system is imperfect. Um, and the reason why the reason why you're better off there is because I think like more often than not, the limiting factor in performance of machine learning systems is not your ability to come up with a good model. Like there's so many like good tool, tools in the toolkit for modeling these days. Um, uh, it's, it's really like your ability to get a lot of um, high quality labeled data. And so if you can set up a system where you start to show predictions to your users in production and you can get feedback from users, um, then you can create like a data flywheel, right? Where you, um, you uh, sort of, as you serve predictions to users, um, the quality uh, your users give you feedback on those predictions and you can use the feedback on those predictions to train the next version of your model. And then your model gets better, which causes your product to get better, which causes you to have more users who give you more feedback. And that's kind of like the virtuous cycle that you ideally want to be creating with, um, when you're trying to build machine learning products. So I think, you know, when you can, you should try to ship something into production first before like putting a lot of effort into modeling. Um, but there's plenty of use cases where like, you know, you have to meet some quality bar before you're able to actually like start serving something in production. And so there, I think like prototyping is the right place to start. Mm 
Yeah, so like uh, with many things in tech, it depends. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it depends. Yeah. Alex? Uh, I think so. We have a few questions about uh, kind of throughout the presentation. We had a few questions about kind of links and maybe to the resources. Uh, one of the questions is about whether uh, you have a GitHub project where some of the code examples uh, could be found uh, of the things that you uh, were talking about? Mm, I don't think I have code examples. Um, we do have a GitHub project for the full stack deep learning course, um, which uh, I think you can find our, on our website. Um, I, I don't think it has examples of all these things because this is sort of a section of the course that we're building out now. Um, but uh, we'll have some, hopefully some ideas for you. And I think I'm happy to share the slides for links to other stuff. All right. And, uh, I guess uh, one last question from the audience. Uh, it's uh, kind of a mouthful. So the uh, question goes as uh, you talk about reproducibility at the beginning, any resources for handling reproducible hermetic builds for counterfactual analysis for post-prod models? Uh, I don't, that's a very specific question. I don't have any research. I don't know of any resources um, specifically on that type of reproducibility. Um, I think like, I don't know, there's, there's a handful of tools now that are like claiming to help with reproducibility. Um, a lot of the experiment tracking tools, um, weights and biases, DVC, MLflow. Um, I think those all have like kind of different approaches to reproducibility and all do a decent job, but not a perfect job of making, you know, making your um, model training runs reproducible. So it's worth taking a look at those as a starting point. Um, and yeah, sorry, I don't have a more specific answer than that. Okay. Uh, actually, we have uh, one more, if you don't mind, and then uh, yeah. we'll call it a day. So the question is about any specific good practices that relate to uh, detecting and uh, dealing with drift with time series regression models, specifically when uh, you have features that are lagging uh, and checking kind of marginal histograms is not enough and mm. uh, conditionals uh, like are computationally hard to uh, uh, like to produce them? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know, I don't know off the top of my head. Like, I imagine there's probably some research on this, but I, I don't, I don't have something to point you to. Um, but uh, whoever asked the question, if you find something, um, shoot me an email because I'd love to learn about it. Right. Yeah. And finally, the request that you kind of share uh, a link uh, to your slide deck. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can do that. All right. Thank you very much. I think we can call it a day. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully you're able to take something out of this. And um, yeah, if you're interested in chatting more about any of this stuff, um, uh, this is something I'm pretty actively thinking about. Yeah. And uh, for everyone uh, in the stream, uh, just one last thing. We're going to uh, share uh, the link with uh, to the raffle and our survey. So the link is uh, bit.ly pydata dash survey. So where uh, it will direct you to uh, one of the Google forms, uh, as I mentioned, with just a couple of questions as, uh, and you get a chance to win uh, JetBrains uh, ID for a year. Yeah, this is a way of collecting feedback, getting ideas from you folks about what topics are you interested in. Uh, what would we would you like to learn about and um, this sort of thing? So it helps us um, um, figure out what what people want to learn, what uh, and discover the topics that we m maybe wouldn't think of. <laughs> so um, go ahead and fill out the survey, and I think we have two licenses to raffle. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Josh, so much. This was very interesting and a lot of material that you have covered. Um, we uh, will share the slides uh, with the uh, members of the group if you send us the link later. And I'm, for one, <laughs> going to go through the slides one more time because there was a lot of useful um, uh, cool. Yeah, I'm happy to share the slides. I'm, I'm always of the opinion of like, I want to throw information at people and then you can go back and digest it again at your own pace. So, yeah, absolutely.
All right. Thanks everyone who joined and hopefully we'll see you in about a month. Yes. Okay. Bye.